Michael Tanella in the occasional series called Heart and Craft. Jeff Minter is an independent artist, and uh, he, like all independent artists, uh, is presented with so many obstacles to trying to get his art from his mind and heart to to the audience. And uh, what um, my question is to many independent artists is like, what? How do we overcome those obstacles together? Maybe there's some common ground. Um, so today uh, I'm presenting you with the video that I recorded talking to independent filmmaker Peter Haas. Uh, Peter, um, during lockdown, um, I became aware that he was trying to get a documentary off the ground and he uh, needed some seed money and started applying for grants. And I found his journey to be uh, extremely informative about the grant writing process. So um, I hope you find this informative as I did. Peter Haas. Peter Haas, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you giving me your time. Of course. Thanks for having me, Paul. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Um, I, full disclosure, we've known each other for quite a while. Um, I, we, we met in uh, film school. I was, a, even though we have a massive age difference, I, I was an older, wiser learner, at the, as they were called at Keene State College. Um, and you, uh, you were uh, this young whippersnapper who was coming up some kind of prodigy. So, um, so we've been we've known each other for a very long time in that context, like you being a filmmaker. Um, obviously, I know what you've done, but maybe for the, for the to give some context to the audience, uh, can you can you give us a bit of uh, history? How did you get into filmmaking? Why filmmaking? Why filmmaking? Ah, geez. Um, well, I think it's uh, aside from the fact that uh, I, it was after working uh, a bunch of jobs, I realized I didn't want to do. Um, I just really enjoy the creative arts and helping um, like help, help tell stories. Like my family's really big into big sort like old school, like family storytelling, et cetera, et cetera. And that just kind of stuck with me. And I'm just kind of taking it into the 20th century, or I guess now 21st century. Uh Oh, um, I mean, you sort of you and, had a, you had a gift for the uh, technology, right? Yeah. And like, I always kind of, um, you know, was always really fascinated by the technology of filmmaking, be it like uh, celluloid film or digital technology or the analog stuff, just the uh, methods uh, of capturing images and then rearranging those images and sounds to tell stories and just kind of share experiences in that way. Um, you know, and like, I think most people who grew up my age, that are like around my age, it's like, we were kind of the first generation of people to have um, home movies that weren't just like little reels of film that like you got maybe two and a half minutes of a movie. Um, got to see entire movies on like beta tapes at, you know, or at a friend's house and rewatch them over and over again. Uh, and so there was always this kind of cinema magic. And then once they realized that, wait a minute, I could do some of that magic myself. That's kind of fun. Um, and then... Uh, kind of like every other project that like every project I kind of go down, like, I'm just not going to let it go. I'm just going to dig in deeper. <laughs> and now here I am. I mean, did you, uh, I mean, I met you at college. I did you work at like local access TV in New Hampshire or something? Or? Yeah. So uh, in college, uh, college, before college, I was doing, um, I was in the vocational high school programs. Uh, so kind of designed for folks who may or may not go to college, but you definitely leave that program with a professional certificate of, of um, not quite an associate's degree, but could easily be translated into something like that academically, uh, but with some really hard skills. And so I trained on uh, a lot of analog uh, video equipment and some like very, very early DV, portable DV stuff. Really, really fascinating. Um, it's actually the first time I ever saw digital nonlinear editing software. Um, Media 100. They had a Media 100 and uh, a Final Cut 1, this new thing called Final Cut Pro 1.5 or something like that. Um, and so I got to do a lot of kind of uh, re like local reporting, which was always fun, and a lot of uh, live production because they had a little like film studio, like a little the talk show studio that all the local celebrities um, uh, would come and like it was really interesting, especially because New Hampshire. I'm from New Hampshire, um, is what used to be really big, like first primary kind of state, right? Um, and so during the, any election year, it was like, oh, some guys in suits and glasses are here. I guess we're doing an interview with the, the you know some presidential nominee is going to be on public access today which was kind of a fun way of very practically learning uh, a very practical way of learning the technology, because not only do you have to know exactly what you're doing, but it has to, because you're going live to air, it must happen by X time and yeah. it has to be right. Yeah. That's um, 
I mean, so, yes. so film, film school was different, though. I mean, that was what, what did you what were your what were your goals going into film school, uh, the film program at, at Keith State College? And what at the end of it, did you get out of it? <laughs> did did yeah, you get everything uh, you wanted out of it? Well, <laughs> oh, boy. Um, OK, memory. Got to go back in time, back in time. Oh, um, <laughs> no, no, it's not. I, I, I kid. Uh, but it's, um, you know, I think one of the motivating factors was that it was greatly impressed upon me. Like, you have to go to college. Like, you might have associate's degree, all these other certificate, like professional certifications, but college is going to be very important. Uh, and so, um, and I, I kind of knew that. And I'm gl- honestly, I'm glad I chose that route because it, 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 I actually wish I had stayed and gotten a mat- like MFA because of the way things are going. We can talk about that later in the New York era. Um, um, but Keene State was great because it was like a local school. It, could, it was very affordable. Uh, and it seemed like they had a very good film program. And it was one of the few programs that uh, I went to and when I visited them. There felt like there was a level of camaraderie between the teachers and students. Um, I visited a lot of schools. That I will not. Yeah, oh, I, I, yeah. A lot of schools that really focused on either um, filmmaking in the terms of, um, but they weren't very technical in in a lot of ways. Right. It was about like how you could be an auteur, right? Which did not really interest. It sounds, it sounds me. like Emerson. <laughs> Uh, um, or they were very focused on film and journalism. Like there was a film and journalism program okay. that was like, you are going to go be a journalist. And I just, there, whenever I would talk with some of the students that were going there, there was animosity between students. One story I've never forgotten was a student talking about how he had just completed his senior thesis project. And uh, I get, they had like rotating small groups of projects that they worked on together. Uh, and they were competing against each other for grades or grades or some type of credit or something. And another student sabotaged his film because they tipped open the canisters for the 16 millimeter and Jeez. fogged a bunch of his stuff. And I kind of knew like, well, I'm not going to this school if I have to like be malicious against my fellow students. That's um, feral. It's just messed up. It was just, it was the, the worst part was a lot of experience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, uh, I think they were paying per semester what my entire Keene State career cost. Uh, for four uh and uh so king state aside from being like a local school and affordable it just had very kind of better vibes than a lot of the other places i went to and they accepted me um but, that's key yeah uh it's very key um but um and i think what was good again uh is it you know like dr benequist or dr larry benequist uh was my thesis was my advisor and he really always focused on really really combining like analytical stuff and practical stuff. He couldn't always teach you the practical things. So he was always shoving me in places like go learn this technical skill, but then also Mm -hmm. never forget these theoretical things, by the way, take extra theory classes Uh, (laughs) around. And it's, and and so that was really great. And I think out of all the things that I learned, um, like a lot of great teachers, a lot of interesting up and down experiences, like any, any human experience. Um, And essentially what I got out of Keynes was a, um, a way to reflect on myself and my work, things I, I did well, things I could do better. Um, and uh, I think one of the great benefits I got out of uh, going to college in general that uh, I didn't know going in was just how it would change how I view media and just kind of how much more analytical and it would make me not just, you know, I feel like I want to do art today, but I have questions and now I'm going to explore it through these mechanisms instead of... Uh, um, and vice versa. Like it's kind of like this two-way stream. It, it changed the way I looked at art. That's how I boil it down. It changed the way I look at like the world and how humans interact with it in a creative way, and how art is like an interactive bit. I love that we're having this conversation because I've never heard that before. That's good. I like that. Um, so uh, you moved to New York. We're, gonna, we're obviously skipping some details here because like I have a destination in mind. But you moved to New York. I mean, and and making your craft, your newly acquired skill, uh, pay. Uh, how did you find uh, um, employment? Uh, you, sure. How did, how did that work out? Yeah. Um, so after college, um, I got a uh, – so Tom Cook, who, who was, the, uh, was the production teacher, head of production, uh, got me in touch with this documentary crew that was shooting around New Hampshire. And they needed um, essentially what we now call a DIT 
uh, they needed to, they were shooting, uh, there was a Showtime documentary and they were shooting all digital. And it was kind of like the new trend because it was like the early, the early, mid aughts. And so DV cam was kind of the big thing. And everyone was like, oh my God, we can shoot for hours. Oh boy, and they did. Um, uh, but they needed someone who could kind of be an editorial room assistant and start managing a workflow and logging all this stuff. And so I went to work for them and they said, hey, we're taking you to New York to help us finish this movie because you know where everything is. And you've managed the process this far. And I was introduced to this uh, editor whose name is Mark Becker. Um, and um, that's, how you he, <laughs> that's, how, yeah, that's how I met Mark. He was hired to edit that film. And, um, and, and through him, I got some other assistant editor jobs around. And, uh, you know, uh, to being an assistant editor in New York, you're working two to three jobs. Uh, you're working at, day, at least one day shift and a, a night shift. And you do that for a few years and eventually someone uh, uh, leaves and you either have to take over as an editor or someone's like, hey, come edit this daytime show, which is what happened to me. And mm -hmm. uh, a friend of my cousin was like, hey, I heard you work in this and we need someone. Can you come in, fill in for us for a couple of days? And, um, uh, you know, you, you show up, you do the work and be nice. <laughs> and, uh, and then once you get that first editor credit, um, I went through a, you know, I was lucky that I got to keep working as an editor. Uh, you always go to the awkward phase of like, I'm an editor. And it's just like, oh, I got another edit job. Um, yeah. And uh, you work through your little niches until you can kind of prove that you're more versatile. Um, I got stuck in home DIY television for a while and then the Food Network you stuff. sure <laughs> did, yeah. That was that uh, felt so bad. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Because you were you were struggling with just like the uh, it's it's, a, it's an endurance thing at that point it's it's TV genre is demanding yeah and oh pretty yeah un, and pretty unrewarding oh yeah I mean like I mean, the the thing was that it was it was really interesting though because most of the time I was working TV genre edit jobs and then working as an assistant editor for documentary like uh, I get like high, like I guess um, conventionally more refined. Yeah. <laughs> or you know more you know, like or, or like documentary Pre work prestige yeah Pre more <laughs> prestige uh documentary work um and just over time i was able to kind of apply a lot of that documentary stuff into the tv work and um uh i just just didn't can't stop won't stop something something uh just keep on going yeah. and it's um i mean so uh, we, you you've always uh, i mean so I mean, I'm probably there's enough of the details here because it is a long journey to get from like from school yeah, to I'm making sorry. your own stuff. Yeah, yeah. But but the the thing is, I can bring to this is that uh, I uh, served in some capacity on on Mothman Country, which was like uh, it's one if not the first uh, documentary you made by yourself. I mean, you, you did some stuff with Keith, but this was this was you. You you spearheaded this production. You went to West Virginia, did a bunch of shooting and. Uh, I don't know. I was I was given like a an EP credit or something. I don't know. Yeah, you got. I, I, mean, I, I was like, more know, of a cheerleader that did the poster. Is what I was. <laughs> that that is a very important part of EP. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, like Mothman Country was kind of this. You know, I've always kind of one of the one of the things that I've always uh, um, loved is a good ghost story, good good spooky or a monster story or something. And Mothman, uh, like Mothman, John Keel's Mothman prophecies, kind of covers all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was just kind of this, you know, uh, interesting story of this town that had this weird experience in the sixties, but it's been something that never went away. It's just kind of uh, doing research and talking with some folks like, Oh no, it's a tourist thing now that mm -hmm. this giant moth man creature, like scared a bunch of people. And then there was a horrible like infrastructure tragedy, a bridge collapse and a bunch of people died just before Christmas. Um, and so I was like, all right, that's gotta be some complex stuff, uh, went on this trip and, uh, it was a very, very educational experience. It's a lot different before that. I'd only made fe like narrative, uh, fiction worked on writing and developing fiction. And this was like my first attempt to like, really, as you say, like make something by myself. Um, I had never intended, uh, for the project to ultimately as it did end up as a kind of, um, documentary, kind of like a journal documentary. Uh, but I thought the material best warranted it just because, A, it was it was an interesting, it was a style that was becoming popular, and just the material just seemed to lend that direction. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was an educational experience, if anything. 
Um, I learned a lot about what it means to up res DV cam to 1080p. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but like, you know, and like you talk about like, uh, like a cheerleader, you know, uh, a lot of the creative act is working, being near people or around people that can, that do tell you to keep going. Um, and that's really what that project, the, the most educational part of that project was learning to keep going. Um, there's actually a year gap between when I ended filming and finished that movie because six months of it, I was just too depressed to work on it. Like I kind of, I was working and then just didn't feel like I had done anything that was worth putting on screen. And so you kind of had, I, like, I had to learn to kind of work through these certain feelings and then talk, the, talk through it with you and some of my other friends um, and like my partner at the time. And just like a lot of people being very supportive and like, why don't you just finish it? You'll feel better. I promise you'll feel better once you finish that exploration and that piece. And I'm glad I did. It, it was yeah. fun. I, I sold it. <laughs> um, oh, you- you got money. Wow. I, yeah. So I where, sold. Where, where did it end up? It ended up on something called Vidi Space. It was a short-lived, uh, paranormal-only, uh, uh, when uh, like online streaming service. Yeah. Um, it aired for like two years on this streaming service. I got oh, some yeah. money. It paid for some of it back. That's great. <laughs> no, uh, good lord. Uh, I was able to pay my composer in full, which was like my first contractual obligation. <laughs> Now you're a proper producer, yeah. You yeah. seal the deal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. getting stuff seen is 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 a massive part of the battle. I mean, that's that's what I'm learning now as a indie film like that. The chance, no, there is no uh, Prince Charming to come and uh, sweep you off your feet at film festivals now. It's, 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 it's and maybe they never existed. Maybe that's the truth. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's, there's, that's, a, yeah, that's a conversation for a different time, though. Yeah, that's what. I mean, so that was that was uh, twenty eleven. When was that? Twenty eleven. That got yeah. The initial the, uh, uh, small theatrical, well, indie theatrical. What I like to call the indie theatrical run in twenty eleven. Um, and uh, my cousin Larry McGovern was also a producer on that. Endlessly helpful and putting me in touch with just like I don't know how he knows all these people or found all these people, but help uh, both Larry and my friend Nicole Host. Like just between the two of them, just know a lot of people in the like creative or interesting fields, and they helped me get it to place, like get the movie to like small indie theaters uh, in Brooklyn, which was more of a thing. Is mostly like oh, we're a coffee shop during the day and a wine bar at night, and we show movies. Uh, mm-hmm. and we hold like seventy five people or whatever, and so it was. Um, but you know, being able to go on a little tour was still fun. Um, oh yeah, because people get to see it, and there's nothing like seeing people kind of at the bar look out you know like look what's going on in this room and then paying five of uh, the five dollar cover charge to come see your movie because they're kind of in th- like enticed by what's happening like um seeing watching people enjoy the movie is way more fun than making the movie let me be very clear <laughs> it's it's certainly the payoff i i, I it's, there's nothing quite like seeing film like film festivals i'm a big, big fan of them even though they're uh monstrous gatekeepers anyway that's a different conversation yeah. um yeah. so so yeah it is a, it's a bit of a leap but uh, let's let's talk about lost in heaven uh because we're now it's like what 2018 this is when you started it something like that uh i started that in 20 late 2019, 2019. really started hitting rubber started hitting the road in 2020 some um it was it was a, it was a so lost in heaven is kind of a uh, historical documentary or like archival based historical documentary or it was supposed to be uh that it kind of explores contemporary politics through the lens of um uh kind of through movies and what are but also at a very human level uh in terms of um and how uh, it's like, and and kind of like how something happened in America, especially technology and politics kind of really started converging in the late eighties and nineties and how it kind of shaped the next 20 or 30 years. Um, You know, and you can't kind of talk about that without talking about how the initial change of politics, uh, I'm sorry, of of politics by technology, which is kind of, at least in American, in the sense of like contemporary America or United States is really like world war one, world war two. But like the, the big uh, the big political push, mm. 1945 forward, and what was the promise? Um, yeah. um, and then had a lot of time in early 2020 for reasons, and so started really developing it. Um, and uh, long story short, to, uh, just not to bury the byline, but the film never got made. 
Um, well, that's a or, huge leap, but but you yeah. wanted it to get made. So, oh, I so did. That's the thing. So I mean, um, Mothman Mothman Country was mm. uh, self funded, right? You, you basically Correct. paid that out of pocket. You had a different strategy for this one. Yes. Uh, so so, so tell, tell me about what your strategy was for watching that. Sure. So after uh, Mothman Country and some other projects I had kind of co-produced uh, with, with Keith Roberts, a friend of mine, um, I kind of decided that this next project, I wanted to tell a film, uh, I wanted to make a film that I know I probably couldn't afford to self-finance, right? Uh, because most of the time with self-finance films, you either have to completely rely on open source archival material, or you have to uh, go and shoot everything yourself um, and kind of fiddle your way from there. What I wanted to do was actually have access to actual histor like historical documents, historical clips, a lot of archival things, um, and especially uh, presidential State of the Union addresses and other things that aren't necessarily open and some other material that let me be isn't open source, right? Where we'd have to pay an archival house for. Uh, and after running the numbers, after, uh, so I put the script together and ran the numbers. I'm like, I can't afford to do this. My I can't afford to pay this out of pocket. Uh, so the approach decided to go with was, ah, I'm going to start applying for grants because there are, especially during uh, lockdown in the United States, more places were starting like, hey, we aren't doing mega grants, but we're doing tiny grants to help artists kind of stay afloat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, with some help, I was, uh, well, after some kind of, I was able, uh, I, yeah, let me restart that. Let me uh, take that again, so to speak, but like, I kind of felt my way through it and was having absolutely no success. Um, and uh, and once I finally, I, I found out uh, Kat Hamilton, hi Kat, I know you're going to be watching this later, uh, um, was able to, who has a lot of experience working in nonprofit world, came in and kind of showed me a lot of what I was doing wrong, uh, or wrong, so to speak. And uh, it, com A, completely was like, what, how is this a thing? Um, uh, but yeah, having to kind of uh, trudge through the mud of trying to go to um, uh, the outside world for financing and not going to individuals, uh, but going to organizations for endowments and such. Um, and so, so there was a lot in what you just said. Uh, yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> so, so no, so that was a strategy, and then you you yeah. tried doing it yourself. So what was the what was the holdup? Why why was it not? Why did you need to find the help of somebody with more experience? Oh yeah, um, so it's a lot. I mean, honestly, uh, uh, I mean, when he's, that I mean, a little bit. Give, so yeah, give, give give somebody some context. So somebody, well, most people who are uh, watching this either are grant curious or want to commiserate. So explain uh, to the uninitiated. What does a grant application look like? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so imagine a, a bureaucratic nightmare. Uh, but no, uh, but so, uh, yeah. Well, actually, um, maybe, maybe back a little bit further. Who, who, what kind of uh, organization offers grants for stars? Sure. Um, I would have to go look at um, my list, but like a lot, there are, uh, there's kind of a few different groups that offer these things. There, are, there is the U.S. government that has artists grants. There are a lot of non-governmental organizations, and there are a lot of non-profit groups, uh, and then there are individuals um, who have non-profit organizations. Um, and a lot of it relies on the giving of top, like individual donors or boards of donors or relies on government funding to be able to provide funds. Uh, and so when you start applying for these things, uh, so they always come in cycles, right? So what you're going to when you start looking for these things, the first thing you're going to see are calendars, and you're going to see eligibility requirements. Uh, and so, and these are like long lists that could very well be condensed, but they're very um, pedantic, in in like by date uh, with, with their calendars and eligibility requirements and little other details we can get to later. Um, so what you're going to see are calendar cycles, eligibility eligibility requirements, and then forms. The forms are packets. Like anyone who's ever applied for college or uh, or unemployment or any anything, it, it doesn't even begin to shake a stick at what these these documents are like. Um, they want you to you have to explain not only who you are, but where you come from, what your plan is, and these are all logical questions. But it it, it gets deeper. Um, and, and you have to talk about your project in very specific ways. 
So you're ta- I'm talking maybe, um, you know, you end up just in the writing part, put 10 to 75 pages together to apply for these grants. And some of them aren't for a whole lot of money. The, one of the grants was ended up being 75 pages of text. Double-spaced. Courier News, size 12. But um, still, this massive booklet uh, beca- to have to send in. Um, and it will take a lot of time. A lot of, lot of time. Um, so we have it is a system that is very time-consuming. And um, one of the more difficult things that you'll find once you start going through these applications is that there um, are specific... It has lingo, it has, it has very specific industry lingo, and um, that isn't very obvious. Uh, well, keep that's, it out. So, so that's the thing, right? So you're, allow me to, 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 to step in and uh, you know, sum up a little bit. So you were tackling these massive documents. And so Catherine uh, has some experience. Did you know her and were showing it to her just because you were like strung out? Or did you say... I hear you're good at this. Can you help me? And then you showed it to her. Or, 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 what was the chain sure. of events? Yeah. So um, I you, had you guys more... knew each other before, right? Correct. Yeah. So we knew each other before. And um, so what had happened was I had started applying for these grants and I had filled one out and it was, it was a shorter one. I think it was only five pages or so. Uh, and I said, Hey, Kat, can you look at this please and give me some feedback? Um, and immediately the response was, let's talk about this. We need to review this. <laughs> um, because, uh, and then, uh, you know, she's a, a, an artist in her own right and a very creative person and, um, uh, really liked the project and, um, is always, is always in my corner. Uh, so she stepped in and said, L- let's work on this together. Um, and so she kind of took on a lot of the grants writing stuff and it became this very collaborative process, uh, where we would sit together for hours, just going through these things. And sometimes she'd disappear and work on something and I'd disappear and work on something and having, you know, uh, she was part of my like COVID bubble. So it was okay to like, uh, come over for coffee. I, I got, you know, sitting and making like a little espresso and like drinking too much coffee and trying to work these things out. Um, and uh, but ultimately, we, we had to develop a process to work on these things uh, where it, it, she, to be very clear, she was the, the she was the, uh, the the cipher for a lot of it. She was able to decode a lot of this stuff for me and help me take a lot of my st- language that I learned in film school and know from television and the film world and completely convert it into the alternate th- this alternate, almost completely separate language. Well, I mean, right. That's what I want to get to. There was like a, an example you, you were talking about when we were uh, discussing this, possibly recording this video. The, the, there was a phrase that they use in the form that you'd answered uh, in good faith. Uh, uh, do you remember the one that I'm talking about? Do you, do you, can, oh. you talk, can you talk us through that just real quick? Sure. So I filled out, so filling out these forms, uh, I, they are very often repetitive, right? A lot mm-hmm. of the same information over and over again. And you know, what is your, what is the title of your film? What is it about? Story, characters, da, 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 da. And then at one point, I reach a spot that says, what is the narrative of your project? And I, was, I just wrote five pages of what the story is. What do you mean? What's the narrative? I don't know how much. And they wanted three more pages or something. And I, uh, minimum three, maximum five pages. And I could not wrap my head around why they would want me like rephrase it. So I spent a week rewriting it, it just like taking the five previous pages and rewriting it down in the three, but changing it up. So I'm like, I'm not plagiarizing myself. I promise. And when I learned later, uh, this is not the question. This is not what they were asking at all. What they were asking was not what is the story or narrative story of your project. What is the schedule of your project? Which never in my life has I have I ever encountered anyone who said, "What's your narrative like this week, Paul?" Like, huh. like you know, what is the schedule? I have since heard it used in distribution speak, uh, 
and that's just in the last couple of months. And I've been in the film business for decades. <laughs> Maybe it's a new thing, newish. Who knows? I mean, you know, it's like every every field creates its own jargon, especially when you didn't go to school for it. Yeah, so, uh, it's also like a lot of fields are starting to like intersect now that we have multimedia, and so like uh, you see this in like TV and and there uh, and like, where there's like documentary lingo being thrown around, TV lingo, and we still use the the word Chiron sometimes, like I mean title card. <laughs> Good lord. Uh, uh, what a, what an ancient throwback, you know. They haven't, had, they haven't actually used the camera since like the '60s, right? Good lord. Anyway, um, so, yeah. so yeah, it's that's a, it's an arduous process. How many grants in total do you think you uh, submitted for for this project? A lot. No, um, uh, no. So well, I pro uh, I can imagine probably somewhere in the realm of a dozen to uh, maybe. A dozen to seventeen different grants of varying sizes, some That's of awesome. which were very big, some of which were a couple of hundred bucks. Um, and but even, uh, but even just even for two people, that's a lot of. Well, was there? I mean, because because each each one sort of demands different versions of the same information, right? It's, it's not like you could just copy and paste a text from one and put it into another. Yes and no. Uh, one thing oh, that so cat, okay. yeah. So one thing that cat is very good about uh, is spreadsheets. <laughs> Um, so a big part of managing this whole thing, uh, was creating spreadsheets, not just to track who and what we're submitting to and when we submit in the schedule and all that kind of thing. Uh, but also all the, using these spreadsheets as way of maintaining, uh, of having a central place for certain information to be, mm -hmm. because a lot of these, uh, a lot of these, uh, forms are asking Oh, what again? What's the story? What's your narrative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And if you write it within a certain broadness mm -hmm. level of like, uh, uh, like uh, you you write it to a certain level, you write it in such a way that, hi, this is the story, and here's this one paragraph version of the story. Now you need a one page version, a three page, and a ten page, or what? Like you see these mm -hmm. patterns in them, so it might not always be the same. But you can start once you've done it, like made a 10 page version of your story treatment for one, you recycle it, you can recycle that, but it might have to be packaged differently, or you might have to go back, bring it into a new document, and you're sitting in word perfect and like, oh, fine, replace and like change, maybe kind of change a point of view because some of them are like, well, please talk about it from the first person, they'll change like the point of view they want it told from, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of it is recycling, but with right. very... Maybe but the raw material is in one central place and then it's just a matter of editing Co right copywriting to, to right form put it in a form that's 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 that's, that's good to know um how many uh, positive responses did you get we got one hey this project sounds great but not this year please submit again and then everything else was a no oh, i'm sorry man. yeah it's uh, it's all right i mean we were at there were some grants that we were asking for a lot of money uh mm -hmm. some of the grants offered up to like 200 like, like a quarter million dollars um uh what was very surprising though was that a lot of these um a lot of some of the grants we applied for that were maybe in the five digits were for new filmmakers or new uh or i should say first feature uh the mothman country was a short technically uh, oh yeah this, uh, this, short this, film. this would have been your first feature yeah my first solo feature and um it was, but uh, yeah, and so, or you have to have no more than five films under your belt and that kind of thing. Um, so we're applying for a lot of these, and even that case, it was, oh, um, not, oh, yeah, a lot of rejection. And I know a lot of people apply for these grants. And that's the other big thing. A lot of people apply mm -hmm. for these grants. And um, there was also kind of a, um, uh, some of the feedback I got from some of the organizations uh, were very good about providing feedback about yeah, like we like this, we like that, but we, you know, this was a concern we had. Um, and part of the film did mention uh, like like QAnon and conspiracy theory culture in the United States mm -hmm. as being bolstered by technology and tech. But in my mind, it's kind of like a clear extension of some things that happened in the nineties. Um, and a lot of places said, "Oh, HBO is doing this thing. That's that." Mm -hmm. It wasn't. But it was close enough, um, right, right. Um, which it is an interesting movie. Everyone should go watch it. Um, but like, um, uh, but um, 
it was very difficult to kind of wade through a lot of these. like, I mean, A, it's always difficult to deal with that level of rejection, especially when you have this thing that you really love and are really passionate about and want to have, right. bring it into the world. Um, um, but um, it was, it can be difficult to, I guess what it taught me was that it was very difficult. It is very difficult when you don't really have say footage for a film. Again, this film wasn't meant to really be a, um, self-shot film it was supposed to be an archival piece with some audio interview conducted audio interviews mm -hmm. um and um uh i know i'm getting a little off question here but i i guess um a big part of it is the kind of um uh, snake eating its own tail infinite uh um, uh infinity thing uh mm -hmm. is that um a lot of the people i would talk to to do interviews wanted to see some, oh, we, they wanted to see that the project was legit enough to have funding in place. Uh, and a lot of the funding wanted to see other people funding the film, like not people, but other organizations funding before they would release money. So it's kind of, if you haven't, if you don't have the right connections to get money in the first place, then we're not going to take a risk and give you money, if that makes sense. Okay. No, oh, yeah, um, especially <laughs> very familiar. Yeah, <laughs> there, there's a, there's a credibility gap. Getting a grant, and I, and I, I was uh, briefly considered applying for grants for for Heart of Neon. It's it's not that kind of film. Um, so, uh, did you consider other forms of funding then? I mean, this is this is what uh, three years ago now. So I'm yeah. Gonna... Um, I had brief. Okay, so in a fit of madness, I thought of like, what if I self funded this movie? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, and then uh, so I challenged myself to uh, so I essentially finished writing the movie right uh, and I said okay what would it cost me to just make the first reel of this movie I sat down broke apart the script recorded the VO myself started get, getting the footage that I'd need and start arranging all of like the, the media. Cause it, again, it's told through the lens of popular, popular and underground media. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, all right, all right. I have this eight to 12 ish minute thing. Let's see how much that would cost. And then I did a kind of post-producer budget on it, mm -hmm. looked at the numbers and quietly closed Excel and uh, and then closed uh, Resolve and just kind of twiddled my thumbs for a second and said, oh, well, <laughs> wow. not this one. Um, the uh, yeah. It's just uh, certain things just require a volume of cash. Um, yeah. And, you know, I could go in online and rip all the stuff uh, or, you know, uh, have my friends get me copies of things and right. that sort of thing. But then it would never be seen, right? And, like, uh, anyone who's so, made so a document... You so right, so that's interesting. So like, so there was a destination involved. You wanted to have it seen. I mean, because if you put it on YouTube, people would see it. But that's not what you wanted, right? Yeah, I mean, like you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yes and no. well, I would say yes and no. Um, because YouTube has got has started to crack more. Uh, a lot of these services have started to crack down on material when it's uh, not being like fair use is being violated now. Um, and I, yeah, I wanted to be able to show this in a the theater or try to sell it to a network or something. Um, not just have it live on YouTube. Uh, cause it, that, that's another whole market that is just very difficult to get into. Uh, I am not a, I, I, I frequently joke that I'm a content creating content creator, creating content, but I, I'm not in the business of having a YouTube channel. Uh, that is a, or, or uh, any of these other kind of like, or professional Twitter accounts or whatever, um, that that's kind of not my jam. That's not what I do. Um, and so I wanted to be able to take this film somewhere. And in order to do that, you just can't use whatever you want and then start screening it because then the cease and desist start arriving and then you get in trouble. Right. Um, right. Or, but the, or, you know, just being able to show it in a place that isn't like, Hi, I brought this little projector, and we're going to show it on a wall at my friend's house. Um, right. So you wanted you wanted to be able to show it with some uh, moral authority. Yeah, so sure. I'll, I'll, yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, it, it is a very punk thing to do to take a bulldog projector like that's you know, uh, was it? Uh, I mean, my favorite reference is the KLF. Like they made that movie about burning a million pounds, and then perversely took it around the UK and showed it to homeless people. I mean, 
that sort of sounds cruel, actually, now saying it out loud, but they, they did that. And, and that was just a projector and stood around parking lots and showed it. Um, and they owned all of that footage. It wasn't like they were trying to get around copyright. Um, so, but it's interesting that it, there are other ways of, and we should probably talk about this outside the video, but there are other ways of like, uh, of getting people to see a film that aren't just TV and, and cinema. And, and it's interesting. Maybe there's an opportunity here for, for independence to, to, to rethink that. Um, I think because to rethink like markets, if if we let the corporations dictate to us what the terms are, then we've already lost. And if you look at it as a long term battle, we need to start winning. So there's that. Um, yeah, that that's actually really interesting. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> storm like, the like, all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I mean, you're right though. I mean, like, if you look at. Um, you know, like, you know, when uh, I mentioned mini TV revolution earlier, the aughts, right? Like, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of movements that came out of the technology, like literally overnight, the, the cost of making a movie drop cut in half. Right. Okay. And, but what didn't change was the mechanisms of delivery. And then once YouTube, originally YouTube, pre Google YouTube got released, uh, or was around and some of these other services like Vimeo, et cetera, um, started streaming uh, would let you put your move you could put your movie online and have it be seen by people right. but the but ultimately these things aren't benefiting the filmmaker they're not benefiting the people who are making the content or the people the films are about uh, who's benefiting from these things mostly YouTube mostly mm -hmm. the corporations that uh, like now it's like what one of like eight six major corporations that uh, own giant chunks of the internet in some way or another um, so we have so even though um, we've right now have like 8K cameras that cost less than uh, a mini DV cam did in 2005, you know we're, we can shoot 8K but we can't show it anywhere. It's very hard to show it to groups of, like mass audiences in any right. meaningful way. Um, so I mean, that's, a lot, that's a lot of data. <laughs> we don't need it, but that's just, that's a conversation for a different video. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I think we've reached the end of this conversation. So, I mean, if, if to the point of the original question, uh, Lost in Heaven, what, what would needed to have been different for you uh, to be able to make, for Lost in Heaven to have been doable? Because uh, it sounded like there was, there was a lot of hurdles, I mean, and, and the grants were just one of them. Yeah, I think uh, the first thing that I would have done differently now is maybe spent another six months in development before I started applying the grants. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have, I, um, yeah, I'll start here. I think the first thing I would have done is cut together that first reel and included that in all the grant applications, which, you know, saying it now sounds pretty straightforward, but, you know, when you don't have any resources and you're trying to get, when you have something on paper and you're a writer, like, mm -hmm. it's like, why isn't this enough? <laughs> um, oh, yeah. um uh, so I probably would have spent more time, uh, kind of developing it visually in, uh, in that way. I made more prototype, more prototypes of the pieces of the written pieces to include. Um, I think a bigger thing that would need to change is more systemic. Um, I think there need to be more art grants. I think that there need to be small, even if they're smaller, just more, um, uh, more focus on taking risk, right? A, a lot of the problems that uh, these NGOs or these these com or these these uh, nonprofits that are giving these grants are beholden to a board, and uh, they are very in the same way that a corporation is beholden to a board. So are a lot of these not you know these nonprofits, and I think that it is that's a shame. Um, and, uh, so that's something that would have to be radically different. <laughs> um, right. I would probably spend more, no, it's, it's hard to say I'd spend more time writing grants. I would spent ridiculous amount of time working on them. Um, but yeah, there would have to be some systemic changes not just, I think, economically as in, as like, as, I think our values, um, we don't, I think as the, the United States in, or the West has stopped kind of holding up art as kind of a cultural as culturally significant um and you see this with how all the major movies and a lot of the art um that's being produced now that gets made is franchise right everything has to be part of a, a greater packaging mm -hmm. um and you know uh, one i always bring up the fact that i very much agree with uh kurt vonnegut's um 
uh, essay about like we should all be writing bad poems all the time and drawing bad pictures uh, because it makes us more human. Um, and I think that like we, since we are kind of blasted with corporate media all day, every day from the minute our phone goes, alarm goes off in the morning and wakes us up to as we're doing our final Duolingo uh, before we pass out uh, at night, um, you know, this is all branded in corporate media. And I think one of the things that would have been more helpful for my project is, is, uh, is if society would look at art as more of a cultural, as, as a, something that's culturally important, not just financially, pro financial product, not just content. Right, it, not just something that is an exchange. Um, uh, right. I make YouTube video, you give me like uh, that kind of thing. Right. But like, it turns into you know, like I made this. I I had these thoughts and these questions, and I put them together using the craft, the art and craft of filmmaking. And let's have an exchange about this now. Um, and because we live under capitalism, these thoughts and acts. These creative acts uh, need, need funding. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't have answers. Yay, I just... <laughs> no. Well, I mean, this has been it's been an excellent conversation. We, we ran way over time. So oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I ramble on. I'm sorry. Oh no, no, it's great. It's great because we could talk to about two hours about this stuff. There's like so <laughs> many details we didn't even touch on. But uh, Peter Hess, thank you very, very, very much for your participation. Um, can't wait to do this again. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. Always a pleasure, Paul.